Today on The Grave Talks, Reincarnation with Gare Allen. Questions that don't have answers We're stuck in loops and left in sorrow The truth just waiting down It's just a dream, right? A reoccurring dream where a native man in the heat of battle pulls his arrow and aims it at a defenseless young woman lying wounded on the ground. What do you do when in that dream you are playing the role of the man with the bow and you find out later that your mother has shared this same reoccurring dream while in the role of the innocent young girl? Is this a story from a past life being relived by two people reincarnated in very different roles? Today, we discuss reincarnation and the many paranormal experiences of Gare Allen. You know, I remember the the moment vividly. It was when I was 12 years old. And so prior to that, um, you know, I had a pretty normal childhood. Um, I was a very vivid dreamer and I am to this day. I, I just turned 51. So I've always had very vivid dreams, um, and I take them seriously. Um, I think they mean something or they're a warning or, you know, there's something in your subconscious trying to get out. So for whatever reason, I pay attention um, to those dreams. But so I dreamt a lot as a child. And um, so I think I had a very vivid imagination as well in my childhood. I loved to write very early on, um, like to draw early on. So I was very drawn to that artistic side of myself. But the first paranormal experience that really that was concrete, that was not a dream, that was something that absolutely happened to me that told me that there was something very different going on than what I had been experiencing up to that point when I was 12 years old. My, um, my bedroom was at the top of the stairs and I went to bed and I lay down and the family dog was at my feet on the bed. And I had just laid down and I, I, it always takes me forever to get to sleep, but so I was probably laying there maybe a moment. And the bed literally just levitated itself. It was probably a couple inches. It wobbled a little bit. And then just as fast as it went up, it dropped back down, but it dropped very hard. Um, My limbs moved. Um, The dog jumped off the bed in reaction. And and I just remember being frozen and, and I had no idea what had happened. And just then my older brother had been coming up the stairs and he sort of peeked in my door and said, what was that noise? Again, giving me confirmation that, you know, something had happened. And I just, you know, it was probably white as a sheet. I just looked at him and he blew it off as another weird little brother moment and and walked off to his bedroom. And um, to this day, you know, I I, I couldn't figure out what had happened. So I turned on the light and I started searching the room and looking for someone or something. And the craziest thing is, is I had, I was big into Ozzy Osbourne and Black Sabbath, that, that big heavy metal guy. And I had this tapestry, and it was an Ozzy Osbourne tapestry, and it had all these different symbols, and including a, a pentagram right in the center. And at the time, I didn't really know what those were about. It was attached to Ozzy, so of course I loved it for that reason. And I had it thumbtacked into the uh, wood paneling of the bedroom, and it was gone. But the tacks were still there. And I was like, okay. And anyway, as I continued to search the room, I found it underneath my bed and it was probably, I don't know, two, maybe a foot and a half by a foot and a half, you know, perfectly square. And it was under my bed, but it was actually placed there. So it was completely flat. All the edges were pulled tight so that it was in uh, like directly underneath my bed and none of the corners were ripped. So it, for it to have been removed, you'd have to take the tacks out, take it down and put the tack back in where it was. Mm-hmm. And so to this day, you know, I, I you know, I've, I've studied up on pentagrams and things and, you know, what that was about. And, and I, I have no idea who or what would have put it underneath my bed. I know a pentagram, you know, positioned a certain way can be a portal and open, you know, a doorway to the other side and, you know, let things in and out. So um, that's kind of that was the first experience I had that told me there was something uh, going on outside of our normal physical lives. That's, I mean, that's amazing to to go and, and look at this and examine this. And I mean, to just the, the physical 
impossibility of of it being of the way that it was placed underneath your bed with it not being ripped out and, and seeing the you know the the little tears from where the the pin pricks got kind of slid out and i mean you could kind of rationalize that and go well maybe a draft or wasn't in good or whatever you know there's all these possi- possibilities you know quote unquote that that maybe did it but when you you have all these weird elements coming together and then a bed levitating out of nowhere had there been anything especially when you look at this retrospectively leading up to this moment maybe not that occurred to you or that happened to you but to anyone else in your family in that house or was this like literally the first moment for anyone that you're aware of in that house having something paranormal happen well, it's interesting because my, I, I mean, myself included, my family's very left brained, you know, and they're, my, my brothers, my father, my mother had wanted nothing to do with the paranormal. And they weren't against it. It just didn't factor into how they saw the world. So when I explained what happened, of course, they immediately just, oh, your brother must have been hiding under the bed. And, you know, and I've been what lifted it up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> OK, that's awesome. <laughs> so he was that strong, you know, so they, they just rationalized it out. Um, so no, to this day, I'm still in contact with my brothers and my father and, you know, they, they kind of, they've, they've read my books and they're very supportive, but there is, I'm like, did nothing happen to you as a kid? Is it really just me? You know, I'm the middle child. So I don't know if they just chalked it up to middle child syndrome, but they just don't see the world that way. And they've never had experiences, but, you know, I had a couple other things happen. In fact, in that bedroom or rather on the outside of it, um, one night I was laying there and, and this huge bang against the back of the, the, the back wall of the room. And at the time, there was nothing but woods behind our house. They hadn't developed that area yet. And so it sounded like a giant rock had been thrown at the back wall and it just shook the room. And I ran downstairs and of course, everybody's looking at me like, what are you doing? I said, did you not hear that? They're like, no. And I go outside fully expecting to see, you know, shattered rock or some debris from what had been thrown against the, the wall. Nothing there. And that happened several times. Um, and, I, and I have one other memory when I was very young is I was standing in the kitchen with, with my brother and my father. We're sort of in a circle talking. And I looked at my brother and he was holding a glass and I just knew he was going to drop it. I don't know why, but I just knew. And so I just waited. And finally, he dropped it, and I gra- I caught it before it hit, you know, five inches from the ground. And my father looked at me, and he was like, great reflexes. And, and I said, well, I knew he was going to drop it. And, of course, you know, they kind of rolled their eyes and let it go. But, you know, I, I think back to that time, and it's like those things happen. And because, you know, everybody in my family was like, oh, there's always an explanation, I sort of just put it aside. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, and, and really what was I going to investigate, you know, that the bed levitated itself is one thing that was scary enough, but you know, to try and understand, I had no idea what a pentagram was. And like you said, the logistics of it coming off the wall and the tax going back in and there's no rip marks. And yeah, I didn't even think to go down that route, you know, at the time it's only in retrospect mm-hmm. when I was like, okay, when I was in my mid twenties and I really delved into metaphysics that I started to pull back um, on some of those memories and try and make sense of them, you know, as an adult with a little more experience and a little more worldwide, <laughs> if, if, if I can. Sure. Do you think your family had experiences that that they just rationalized away, that the like individual experiences or, or experiences aside from, from you, aside from your experiences that were shared that maybe they just kind of, well, you know, that was kind of strange, but here's what it was. And and you, had it happened you know, to you, would have been like, no, that's that's not what that was. You know, I'd be, I have to be very careful not to, you know, jump to the paranormal explanation where they're concerned for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's an interesting question. Over the years, absolutely not. I never really got any kind of, hey, Gary, this happened, or, you know, and then I tried to offer some paranormal perspective or anything like that. That my brothers and father have shared nothing like that with me over the years. And we've had plenty of conversations and I've shared many of my stories. Mm-hmm. You know, they read them in my books. And, you know, my dad will say, you know, that bed levitating, uh, isn't that the time your brother hid under the bed and scared you? And I said, that happened too. But again, he didn't lift my bed with his <laughs> knees and hands. <laughs> and the guy just wasn't that strong and he was a big dude. Yeah. And it was a little, it was actually just, you know, a very smaller bed at the time. I was 12 years old. Mm-hmm. But my mother, again, very left brain woman, very practical she two things happened um and it was right before her passing and i went to her house one morning and and she said something happened and i said what happened 
And she said she used to get up at like five o'clock in the morning, sometimes even earlier. So it was dark out. And she said, I got up and I walked over to the window and it happened to be a full moon. And she said there was this beautiful angel just sitting on the moon, just smiling at me. And my, my mother had never said anything like that. I'd never described any kind of story like that or any kind of experience at all in any way, shape or form. Again, big supporter of me and, and, and my books, but just never contributed anything until that morning. And, and, and she was just dumbstruck. She's like, what, what really overwhelmed her emotionally was that the angel was smiling at her. She knew it was smiling at her. It wasn't that it was an angel on a full moon. It was the fact that it was smiling at her that really touched her. And she said she rubbed her eyes and she looked and it was still there. And her cat, I guess, ran and, and beneath her and hit her legs. And she looked down. And then when she looked back up, it was gone. And for, in, in, in my heart of hearts, Unfortunately, I knew that was a sign that, you know, she wasn't she wasn't going to be with me much longer. And unfortunately, a few months later, she did pass. Mm -hmm. But after that conversation, we were talking and it kind of, you know, brought up the subject of dreams and things. And I dream so much and I have, you know, um, dreams over and repetitive dreams. And I asked her, I said, have you ever had a recurring dream? And I was about to tell her mine because I fully expected her to go, no. And I was, okay, let me share the one I had. She goes, you know, I have had one my entire life. And I go, really? And she's like, yeah. And she explained that in the dream, she was a young girl and she was with um, pioneers of the time who were, who were on a wagon trail and they were trying to find a new home. And they were crossing, you know, somewhere in Wyoming or in that area. And they were attacked by the Native Americans at the time and they slaughtered them. And all her family was slaughtered, and she could look around and see them dead and bloody, and, and all the Native Americans were on their horses and running around. And she looked up, and there was one Native American on a horse, and he's pulling back his arrow right at her and just getting ready to release it. And she always woke up just before he released the arrow. And I... I, 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 I started to cry because it was the most amazing connection I've ever had to my mother because my recurring dream of my life was of being a Native American on a horse <laughs> pulling an arrow back and aiming it at a little small girl. And I always woke up before I released it. And I didn't tell her. I did. I, I held it in. I wanted to tell her, but I, I, she's like, what's wrong? I'm like, I, I just, no, yeah. I couldn't share it. I just couldn't do it. That would be an amazing uh, I, I, I'm assuming amazing conversation I wonder how that would have gone I'm sure you've probably played that out a thousand times in your mind of had you had the opportunity to share that yeah um, I you know to say I regret it a little bit but I'm sure I'm not a hundred percent sure I'd want to go back and share it because yeah. in in my mind and again I come from <laughs> a left brain family yeah so I still look for to debunk things I'm you know sure. I just don't take everything you know without looking into it and, and researching it and so but again when when something resonates and you get that emotional feeling and it's in your gut that instinct mm -hmm. um but it kind of i kind of felt that that was a shared past life yeah you know the coincidence of us having that dream from each other's perspective and having it over and over and over and and the specifics of it too and you know we're just too dead on for me yeah. to be any sort of coincidence um and so you know sometimes you choose you know look i can't prove to you that that happened obviously mm -hmm. but it did happen and so you know i choose to believe that that was a lifetime where that was our dynamic well that's kind of a disturbing dynamic to carry in and tell your mother you know hey you know, i killed you last life or whatever lifetime yeah. that was or i believe that's what happened i'm not sure that was the day to have that conversation she just saw an angel <laughs> on the phone right <laughs> so. well it, it brings up so many questions then about when you have dreams of that nature that are where, where you feel that you are not yourself you are essentially viewing the world from another individual's perspective in another place in time uh, and and then the dynamic then of of how families are formed if in fact it is something along the line of past lives still mingle together as, as new families are, are you know come together when new children are brought into the world it's it's almost it's almost movie like I mean you could almost do a movie of that where it's it's generation after generation and all these bizarre tragic occurrences that that happen from murder to to what have you and then suddenly 
they all realize, oh my God, you're the guy that murdered me in this past life. <laughs> and and it, yeah. it, it could be a great uh, horror comedy right there. Uh, but it, it's, yeah. it's, it's... How do you it, reconcile exactly. that? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know? how do you? And it really makes you wonder then sometimes about if in fact that is how things work, um, which obviously none of us know for sure, but it, let's just go down that path for a minute because that's a really interesting dream. It then kind of may ex explain in some ways, shapes and forms, sometimes the odd duck children uh, of a family where it's like, well, why is it that they just, you know, the same family, same parenting, same everything. But then there's this one that really just kind of was, you know, out there or, or or didn't fit in with the mold. Maybe that explains that sometime. Maybe it's because of, of you know, who that person has been in, in previous life and is to, at the core today. It just doesn't fit the mold of the rest of the group. But I don't know. It, it, it's interesting. Did you ever have the conversation sharing that story with any of your siblings of the, the conversation you have with your mother? I did. So, um, you know, the passing of my mother was was devastating. Sure. And so but my brother and I all came together and and handled it. Um, and we spent some time together and shared stories. And um, I was caring for my mother when she passed. She actually passed in my home. Um, so my brothers, you know, came to me and, and, and we, we settled and handled everything after the fact. But of course I had to, you know, explain and share, you know, some of the things that went, ha that went down. And, um, you know, I did share that story and, you know, the, in the moment I did, it was, it was one of sort of understanding that she's at peace now. So you sort of start to think, and I actually had an issue with it, um, probably about a year after she passed. Um, I was going through, I guess, the stages of grief. You know, I actually Googled it again, left brain guy. I sure. need to know what's going on. So I'm like looking up grief and you go through all these stages. And um, I got stuck in, in guilt because I, I was like, I don't know. I, I'm, it used to be, you know, looking for ghosts and the other si things on the other side was fun. But you hear about a lot of spirits that are trapped. They haven't passed over. You know, maybe even they're being tormented or, you know, for whatever reason, they haven't gone on to wherever it is we go, heaven or whatever. And I wondered about that. I said, I wonder if my mother is at peace, sure. you know, because maybe she's not. Maybe, you know, I need to help her. And, and this is my arena. So we're, I need a confirmation that she's actually passed over and she's at peace. And that became insanely important to me. And it, it caught me off guard because I never really thought about it before. And to be honest with you, I hadn't really lost anybody in my family until that happened. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of, I don't know about a lot of people, but to lose your mother before anybody else, and not that I want to warm up with cousins and other people, but it's like, man, <laughs> to take that, take that person first, it's like, you know, I'm going to be able to handle the rest of them, you know, a little bit better, I guess, is one way of looking at that. But <laughs> sure. so I was obsessed. I was obsessed with, with making sure she's okay, because, you know, I'll talk about it in a little bit, but, you know, the house I bought in 1999, you know, was haunted um, based on a suicide that occurred in the house. So when she passed in my home, all those things sort of came together and I and I started to put them together and and, and probably not intelligently because, you know, it was it was wrought with, you know, emotion and, and, and pain. But, I, you know, my poor workout partner, I was talking to like at the gym and I'm telling him about this and the poor guy's just looking at me like I got three heads and, you know, and I'm like, I don't know, I just I can't reconcile it. And anyway, so I, I get home and I go to send him a text like, hey, man, you know, sorry, I got a little weird on you. You know, I was just venting. And I went to hit the voice dictation, and as soon as it beat, it beat off. And it had done that before, you know, for whatever reason it didn't take. So I went to hit it again so that I could do a voice dictation of a text to him. And in that split second that those two beeps had hit, it recorded two words. And keep in mind, there was no radio, no TV. The dogs were outside. Nobody else was home but me. And there was no noise. And it recorded two words, Mom, good. Wow. And it was like, we're talking like literally after I had this conversation, literally right about, I'm, I'm going to send a text to this guy, you know, about it. And I just, I got my, I got my confirmation. I got it. And, and it was just, and again, you know, I can't prove to you that that was sure. my mother or someone giving me a message, but you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to choose to take that one a hundred percent. I think we're seeing more and more uh, paranormal interaction and and use of technology with the other side, uh, being able to get messages across clearer than ever before. And and some can write it off and some will say, well, it's just this or that. I mean, you could do that with any any form of, of trying to identify these things. But I, I do believe that that 
more and more we are seeing them find ways of manipulating our devices to get a message across. Um, what an interesting message to get at that moment. Did that give you the peace that you were looking for at that moment when you got that message? It definitely, so, so that fear, yes, to answer your question, yeah, because that fear was blocking me from getting through the stages of grief. I was stuck there and, and, and I, and I had seen it as guilt because I should be able to help her if she, there is a problem on the other side. So it was a very strange and, you know, I was not going to take it to any kind of, you know, counselor. They just laughed me out the door, I'm sure. But sure. it was like, how do you know if your loved one's okay on the other side? You know, no one, there's no one to check in with. So it did, it helped me move past that. I absolutely just got past it. And, um, you know, I, I still miss her terribly. i um, just past the 10 year anniversary of her passing. Um, but that was a big milestone too. And um, so, yeah, it definitely helped me. So in that case, the paranormal came through, sure. you know, and you're right. I mean, there's more electronics today than ever before. You know, everything's an you know, electronic device that can do anything and for everything. So there's so much more, you know, they don't have to like, you know, tap on the window with Morse code to give us a message anymore. They can kind of come through our electronics and get the message through, you know, in a number of ways now. Let's take a step back uh, further uh, prior to your mother's passing, way before that. I, I want to go into kind of your early 20s uh, when you started doing some research into the paranormal and you started to identify some of these things that happened in your childhood and, and you started to really dig in and realize, oh, okay, that pentagram wasn't such a good thing that was on my wall uh, and, and really started <laughs> to to go, oh, Oh, this is starting to make more sense. And then beginning your 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 journey as an adult into the investigating of, of the paranormal. Take us there. So I think it was 1995. Um, I was working a job that I absolutely hated and um, I decided to take a, a year off and I did. So I left the job and I had no idea what I was going to do, um, but I was driving one day. And I happened to see a metaphysical bookstore um, right off the street from one of the streets near my house. And I just turned in and I had no idea what it was about, um, but something just made me go in there. And to this day, again, I didn't even think I knew what metaphysics was at the time. And I walk in and that moment brought me my first psychic reading. It brought me my first past life regression. Um, I became very good friends with uh, one of the managers there um, who brought me my first channeling experience. And all that happened within months of, of walking through that door. And I devoured pretty much every book on reincarnation. For whatever reason, um, I became obsessed with reincarnation. And so I read every book in there, and then I jumped from reincarnation to astral projection to divination and reading tarot to, you know, alien interaction. And, and, and I just I couldn't get enough of it. So I was sort of going through my own uh, paranormal metaphysical 101 schooling mm -hmm. um, on my own. And so the, but the first experience was after meeting this, this manager is after a couple of months of friendship, he's like, Hey, you know, I want to channel for you. And I said, I have no idea what that is. And he's like, you'll see. And I don't know if you're familiar um, or ever seen anybody unconsciously channel a disembodied spirit, but it's, um, it's an, it's a, it's an amazing experience. And it's also a little scary at the same time. The closest thing I can describe it to or compare it to is, uh, and remember the movie ghost with Whoopi Goldberg. Mm -hmm. Um, sure. where somebody jumps in her body real quick and kind of talks through her, except it's, it's a lot more intense. Um, so I'll describe the, the situation. So we turned down the air conditioning in his apartment and he said, it's going to get warm in here because of the energy. And I said, okay. And I was sitting across the room and I said, should I move closer? And he's like, no, don't worry. You'll be able to hear her. I'm like her. And he's like, yeah. And, and I, again, I really had no idea what to expect. We kind of, we had pizza and beer that night. We we're just kind of hanging out. And he says, anyway, he starts humming. And the next thing I know, this woman's voice comes out of him and just starts speaking to me and introduces herself uh, as Zephyra. And she's his spirit guide and she's going on. And I'm sort of like, okay, you know, this is funny, you know, whatever. And, and it's going on and on and on. And I'm waiting for him to break character, to break the sound of his voice for something to, you know, he can't keep this up forever. And it, it, he, he, he maintained it. And I felt an energy in the room and it was palpable and it was real. And I just, and she talked to me about my life and, and about things that he didn't know, but again, left brain guy going, he could have figured out some things, you know, everybody digs through garbage, you know, that sort of thing. So it wasn't until the very end, 
and, and it was a lot of a lot of teachings about how to go at physical life and and the lessons we learn and why we reincarnate and those sorts of things. So it was you know kind of mirrored some of the things I'd read in the in the uh, reincarnation books. So at the very end of the session, it was probably a thirty minute session or so. And she says, I want to reference one last thing. And I said, what's that? And she said, the dream you had last night. And she told me the dream I had. <laughs> and then I had not told anyone about that dream. So obviously, whatever, whoever was coming through could read my subconscious and, and, or my mind and know my dream. And that's when it just hit me that everything was real in mm-hmm. that moment. And that was actually happening. So now... The other side to me, it wasn't yet ghosts. I wasn't there yet. I was more, the other side is metaphysical. It's spirit guides, and and you reincarnate and that sort of thing. It's astral projection. You get on the astral plane, and you can travel out of your body, that sort of thing. That's what I was focused on. It wasn't until later that I was like, oh, there's more on the other side. There's ghosts and demons and some other things. that, And look, there's people that hunt them. (laughs) Uh That's an interesting world. So, yeah, so I started very much metaphysics, um, and then kind of later went into the paranormal. So I had all these experiences and, and, and so I had to get them on paper. And so I started to write them down and I wrote seven short stories. Um, they're all seven chapters and they all begin with the, the letter seven. So the first one's called seven sessions. Next one's called seven regressions and it focuses on reincarnation. Then I go into seven apparitions where the apparitions are ghosts and then seven abductions goes into aliens. Seven projections is astral projection um, seven predictions is the uh, divination, and then I wrap it up in seven reflections where it's all tied together. And it was sort of my attempt at a paranormal metaphysical 101 of what happened to me. And I wrote it as fictional characters, but I put in those things that happened to me um, while connecting them all. So I took some liberties with the experience, but they were based on everything that had happened to me. And so many people asked me, did those things really happen? Those things really happen? And I said, okay. So then I decided to write The Dead, and that is literally everything that happened to me from, it actually opens with the bed levitating at 12 years old, and then all the way to 2014 when I finished writing it. Every paranormal metaphysical experience I'd had up to that point. And that's just, you know, 100% everything that happened in my life. Sure. So I'm, I'm glad I got it down and written down because I just turned 51 and you know, the memory, I could hide my own Easter eggs at this point. I'm really starting to forget <laughs> things, so I can actually go back and read these things. And, you know, of course, doing, you know, podcasting you know, certainly helps for me to recall those stories for sure. I swear to God, even the memory, uh, like the, the, what are they, like the, the jellyfish, uh, uh, mind things that here, here I'm, I'm having a mind part of what like Prevagen and things of that nature. I'm not noticing any difference. Damn it. I'm, I'll start eating the jellyfish if that helps. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Dan, why, sure. you're taking the prevention like man. fuck that give me a jellyfish we're gonna start remembering shit kids yeah that's that's, <laughs> that's gonna be how it works uh so um uh, let's talk about reincarnation uh, and what you've learned about it uh it's an area i i am not super uh, you know involved in or, or or really aware of it certainly comes up in conversation and in our stories many times um but it's an area that i i i am not very well informed on um through your research and things that you've studied over the years um Obviously, a very interesting dynamic from what your mother told you from that story uh, of of the, this view of, of you shooting the arrow or you having this in your dream and then her being a child being shot with an arrow, or at least that's the assumption right before everyone wakes up. Are there any rules to reincarnation as far as who ends up landing where as the process recycles itself? You know, so... I went through many channeling sessions and of course people have done a lot of um, uh, counseling and and regressions and there's a lot of books out there performed by doctors. So you have that perspective, but um, obviously a disembodied spirit who is on the other side might have a little bit of a better perspective on reincarnation. reincarnation. So I sort of side and and listened to some of the things they've said over the years and there really are no rules. What there is is an agreed upon arrangement Mm-hmm. beforehand and it's based on the previous lifetimes now with that you have a different perspective of those lifetimes so what happens is you know you cross over tomorrow and you you know someone who you didn't get along with or another you know, did you wrong and you, you know you, you passed away you know hating them or really disliking them 
you suddenly understand why they did it. You understand where they were coming from, and you let go of the anger. Your ego goes away. So you don't hold on to that, you know, just out of pride. All that goes away, and you get it. You get that they were acting out towards you because of something else that happened to them. And so you actually understand it, and you forgive it and because there's no pride and no ego. But it all still has to be balanced. There's this universal law of balance. And again, this is what was explained to me in I've never had anything or read anything to the contrary, but it, it makes perfect sense. So you go back into a lifetime at some point together, and, and they're not always sequential either. And you say, okay, hey, last time this happened, so now this has to happen to balance it back out. And it's just bringing things into alignment. And what was interesting was I asked, I said, is it always the same people? And the answer was no, but... I guess as spirits or souls, we're sort of grown. There are soul families out there. And so you may be more compatible with somebody from your soul family because the spiritual blueprint of your soul just meshes well, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Sure. So you tend to reincarnate and interact because you can go further and be many more things with that individual as opposed to somebody who's from a strange spiritual blueprint. Now, they may play a part you know, in a great adversary or someone who has no emotional connection, but comes into your life to sort of, you know, put up a struggle or a situation to help you grow and evolve in that scenario. I, don't, I mean, there's so many players in your life. There's some that have come in and out for two seconds and some that stay forever and everything in between. If you think about it, you know, over the years, the people you've interacted with, and there could be somebody who was absolutely responsible for getting you your first job, you know, but it was a but you barely knew them. It just, they were there, they dug you, they got the job. And then that was it. They were done with their role in your life. And so there's so many. So you, I, I don't get like bogged down with, oh, we get along. So we must have been this or that in the past life. It's not about that at all. Um, what it is, is trying to understand if somebody had, if I have a strong reaction to somebody relationship wise, or they have a strong involvement in my life or vice versa, that kind of clues me into paying attention mm -hmm. because we kind of probably have something to do with each other. And I want to see what it is. And I want to make sure that, you know, as much as I can, you know, that it, it, it goes out and rolls out right and, and we're good to each other or it's resolved, you know, as, as positively as it, as it can be. And, of course, not having any previous experience, you know, that's a, that's a hard endeavor. But I, I will say that when I started doing um, regressions, and, and I was actually regressed by a hypnotist a couple times, um, but I did them on my own um, with the uh, assistance of a then cassette <laughs> back in the day. And um, and I had some, some some success with it, but I kept going back to the same lifetime. And it's the lifetime that I wrote about in the seven lessons, short stories. And it was the most recent lifetime. And I was in a, I was in a terrible uh, motorcycle accident that left me paralyzed. And I was in a wheelchair for 13 years and literally just sat in, at home and unfortunately, my girlfriend at the time was on the back of the bike and she passed from that accident. And I was left in this wheelchair and I was left with her cat, which was like this constant reminder. And so I was, you know, I turned to drugs and everything. It was a, it was a, it was a miserable existence, an absolutely miserable existence. And up until the point until I tapped into that lifetime, I had never in this lifetime, I had never been able to sleep with covers on me or pajama bottoms. I would get claustrophobic if I had anything on my legs when I was going to bed. And after I tapped in, that completely went away. And, you know, I've had people challenge me on that and, and I never understood why. And I said, I don't understand the difference between that and if you almost drowned at three years old in a swimming pool and you, were, you blocked it, but then you remembered it in adulthood and that helped release the fear of swimming. I don't see the difference. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's in your subconscious, it's in your subconscious. You know, what does it matter which lifetime it happened in? That wraps up part one of our interview with Gare Allen. Be sure to check out all of his books. You can find them on Amazon and wherever books are sold. In part two, we'll continue the discussion and ask, do we have a choice in understanding or viewing our past lives? Do people ever have views from past lives in dreams, but just write it off simply as that, as a dream and never fully grasp that they are in fact seeing a past life? Is there ever a danger in using modern ghost communication devices over a Ouija board? And is there ever a way to 100% protect yourself from a negative or dark spirit that has malevolent intent? 
All of that and more in part two. To hear it, become a Gravekeeper. That's a supporter of our program at patreon.com slash thegravetalks or go to our website, thegravetalks.com and follow the links to become a Gravekeeper. When you become a Gravekeeper, you'll have access to all of our episodes in their entirety, part one and part two. You'll also get access to advanced episodes months before they're released to the public. Patreon.com slash The Grave Talks to get complete access. Until next time, for The Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening. Quit.